Happy New Year, and welcome to Through the Bible. You've made a really good decision to start your year in God's Word with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, as you may know, we're on a five-year journey through the entire Bible, and we're studying one book at a time, and we're weaving our way between the Old and New Testaments. And Through the Bible has been making this five-year trip now for more than 55 years. It's hard to believe. And to celebrate a new year, Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, and I want to take a few minutes to talk about how God has blessed us in the past, how he's changing lives today, and then what direction he's leading us to in the future. Greg, what do you have for us? Those are some uh, major and great questions. Steve, it really is exciting. Of course, it's the beginning of a brand new calendar year. We all are thinking about the year ahead. And it, it's good to look back, though, isn't it? It is. And uh, I, I think one of the things that I find a, to be a wonderful exercise is just to, to try to imagine how many people have ridden the Bible bus in these past five and a half decades. Yeah, it's incredible. I think about, you know, the virtual sign at through the Bible, like uh, the McDonald's sign, you know, yeah. over, <laughs> it, I think it now just says billions yeah. served. And, you know, I, I wonder if it's, you know, those kind of numbers with through the Bible, maybe not billions, but yeah, certainly a lot. Certainly in the millions. And of course, we know that our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, puts the onus on us to get the seed out there. As he says, just fling the word of God out there around the world, and it's up to him. But we have heard so many stories of God transforming lives. Yep. We've gotten letters from people who are in their 90s who say they began listening from the beginning. Yeah, it's incredible. And I, you know, I think about how much has changed as you look at the ministry. And the wonderful thing is you go to Hebrews 13, you think about what the author says there, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So Amen. the gospel, the message has not changed, but you look at the delivery methods that we're using, mm-hmm. uh, the way we're repurposing Dr. McGee's content into different formats yep. that get people ultimately to the to the mothership, the five-year yeah, that's program. Right. That's, that's right. the goal. But the impact that it's having has just been incredible. Yeah. And I think it's good that some things have changed over all these years. If we were still using reel-to-reel tapes and shipping them out in literal wooden boxes, which yeah. is what the, the ministry was doing many, many decades ago, we now are saving so much money by using digital technologies. But as you said, particularly in the global sphere. We are moving also toward audio visual mm-hmm. uh, because it's not Dr. McGee speaking in Hindi. It's a, it's a gentleman from India. Yeah. And so he can do a video. He can do uh, something that we put on YouTube or something that we post uh, so people can watch it on their phones. So we are excited about the new uh, delivery methods. Yeah. What else is new? If you had to tell somebody, hey, what are we doing in 2022 we weren't doing before? Well, the thing I just mentioned is is a relatively new development that will really take root in 2022, and that is about 25% of our global languages. That's a, out of 130 languages. Uh, about 30 of them are going to be in an audiovisual or just a video format, and that's ex- that, that's extraordinary, really, yeah, for us. Yeah. yeah, I think about the way smartphones have changed, and we're continually going to that yep. that area. Um, I think of the numbers of people relative to smartphones, and there's actually now, I believe, in some areas, more smartphones than there are people. That is correct. Because yeah. they're carrying a couple of smartphones. <laughs> exactly. And I think just in, in aggregate, there's something like 80% of the people on Earth have an active mobile device in their hands. And that's just something, Steve, that just blows my mind. Yeah. One of the things I love about a new year is I'm big on New Year's resolutions. Not because I'm, you know you break them. Everybody says the average one lasts about 14 days. But... I like it because it's a fresh start. And I'd like to challenge you, if you're listening to this today, it's January 3rd, beginning of 2022, read the scripture in advance. If you've been a regular listener and maybe you know, reading the scripture before the study hasn't been a, a regular part of your life, do it. You've got that smartphone, go ahead and do it. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin our study? Father, we do thank you for a new day and a new year ahead of us, and we pray that you will allow us to be immersed in your word all year long and to see you work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we left off last time seeing the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we made the statement that it was impossible for him to fall. And the testing was not to see if he would fall, but to show that he couldn't fall. And that was the demonstration. Now, after the testing, he needed strengthening. And verse 14 tells about that. And Jesus returned, that is, from the testing, in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, 
And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now, as we've said, after the temptation, he was strengthened. Temptation will do one of two things for an individual today. It'll either strengthen you or weaken you. Now, our Lord so identified himself with mankind, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So he needed strengthening. Now, we notice here that when he came into his home area, that he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. He was praised and complimented. And it sounds like a doxology here. You know, it's possible to praise him and still reject him. It's possible to sing the doxology and then to turn down his claims. The same crowd that sang Hosanna that was wanting to crown him, one day, the next day, they join with the mob to crucify him. The picture of the crucifixion by Tintoretta in Venice. It shows a donkey in the background feeding on withered palm branches, and then it shows the empty cross. That's the way it was. One day he comes in in his praise. The next day they crucify him. And now that brings us here to one of the most beautiful incidents. It's a scintillating story. It's flashing with light. It's fragrant with meaning, and it's lovely to look at. And I'm going to let Luke tell this to us. I'm going to begin reading at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, this is an incident that only Dr. Luke records. And it's a remarkable incident, by the way, so remarkable that we can't pass it by here without saying something about it. Now, we are told here that he came back to his hometown. And generally, the hometown is proud of the local boy. Nazareth was his hometown. And we're told, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He never entertained the false notion that you can worship God in nature as well as in the appointed place. Now, I enjoy playing golf but I get a little weary of hearing some man say very piously, I can worship God just as easy on the golf course on Sunday as I can in church. And you know what the answer to that is? The answer is, you can. But the question I always put to a man that says that to me is, well, when you go out to the golf course and take your golf bag on Sunday morning, do you go out to worship or to play golf? And, you know, invariably, they begin to hum and haw. And I said, now, don't kid me. You go out to play golf, don't you? You really don't go out to worship God. And the fact of the matter is, you don't worship God. Now, I said, frankly, I think there's something wrong with any person that gets a golf bag, goes out on a golf course, and says, I'm out here to worship God. I think a man like that, you ought to call the wagon with the man with the little white coat to come and get him and take him away. Now, I, frankly, I go to church on Sunday to worship God. I go out on the golf course on Monday morning to play golf, and I don't go out there to worship God. Now, many times I've had to stop and do stop and just look around at the glorious scenery, and I just thank God for the privilege of being there. But my friend, I go out there to play golf. Something wrong with you if you do it any other way than that. The custom of our Lord was to go into the synagogue. 
Now, just a moment. Did you notice where he went? The synagogue. The synagogue grew up during or after the Babylonian captivity. And by the time of our Lord, it had degenerated into that which was not in the purpose of God at all. If there had been an evangelical place to worship God, I think he would have gone there. But he attended that which was in existence in his day, and it was far from God. And I do not know whether some brethren today would have said to him, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. He went to the synagogue, and that's the only comment that I can make. I say to stay where you can bear a testimony for God. And if you can't bear a testimony for God, then get out of the place. There are too many folk today, though, that are just hanging on and they know they don't have a testimony. And they're staying in a liberal church because Grandpa happened to be the man who built the place or he gave the land or... He was the head deacon, or he was the pastor of the church. Well, my friend, if that place is departed from the faith, you have no business being there. But if you've got a witness, then hang around, because we ought to be around where we can give a witness today. Now, will you notice, as is custom, he attended regularly. I can now fill in one day of the silent years, one day of seven, I should say, Every seventh day, he went to the synagogue, the silent years. Now, I don't know too much about the other six days. He was a carpenter, and he worked those days, but he went to the appointed place of worship because he could witness there. Now, there was handed to him the book, and he read in it. And what book did he read in? Well, he read in Isaiah. What chapter did he read? Well, he didn't read in any chapter because the Bible wasn't divided in the chapters and verses in that day. But in my Bible, it happened to be chapter 61 of Isaiah, verse 1. If you have your Bible there, stay with Luke, the fourth chapter, and watch, beginning with verse 18, and I'll read what Isaiah said. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort them that mourn and to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, etc., and etc. And I'll not read any more because the point I want to make is right here. Do you notice where he broke off the reading? It says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book and gave it again to the minister. Well, when you go back and read that, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, he didn't even stop at the end of a sentence. He stopped at the end of a comma. There wasn't even a comma in that day. He didn't mention the next, the day of vengeance of our God, and what is to follow after that. You know why? Because... He looked at that crowd and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. In other words, here is a passage of scripture that was going to be fulfilled down to a comma, and the other part won't be fulfilled till he comes back the second time. Here is his interpretation of scripture. I like his lots better than I like some of the modern commentators, by the way. This was fulfilled up to this. The day of vengeance has not come. The time when he said, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. How is he going to get them? Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. That's the way he's coming to power. That's the day of vengeance. That's the great day of the Lord. That will take place when he comes the second time. We are living in this wonderful day when he was anointed of the Spirit to preach the gospel to the poor, And what was that? That poor sinners might be saved today. That's the glorious message that he came to give. Now we read, And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And that seemed to spoil it all. You see, he's a carpenter. How could he be the Messiah? Well, Luke's making it very clear that he took upon himself our frail humanity. Now, will you notice? 
He said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naam, the Syrian. This is a marvelous thing that he did. He took two Gentiles. This woman of Sarepta lived outside of the land. Naam was a captain in the army of the king of Syria, and he was healed. The very wonderful thing is this, that these people were apt to miss a great blessing because they would not accept who he was. And they would be like the many widows in that day that their son died and they lost him. And they'd be like many lepers in that day that were not healed. And all day in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. You see, his hometown rejected him. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. And that's rough country, by the way, around Nazareth. They intended to kill him, you can see. They were going to get rid of him. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. And that, I consider, is a miracle, his escape from this mob, because the mob intended to get rid of him. Now we are told, And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And you have now, as we've seen before in both Matthew and Mark, that the Lord Jesus moved his headquarters all the way from his hometown of Nazareth down to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Oh, that's not too many miles, and yet in that day when most people walked, it would be quite a distance. But he shifted his headquarters because his hometown would not receive him at all. That is the picture that's given to us here. Now we have here in Capernaum the same thing we had in both Matthew and especially in Mark. And what we have is one day that's spent with Jesus, and that you have in the rest of this chapter. And there are many of us that would love to have spent a day with him when he was here on earth during his earthly ministry. Well, Luke makes that possible for you. He gives us the happenings of one day. It's a busy day. It was a Sabbath day. Mark gave this to us, and I went into detail there. I'll not go into too much detail here. And he was in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. He had to leave. They rejected him. They would have gotten rid of him. And he goes to Capernaum now. He makes this his headquarters. And there did come a day when he says, And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven will be cast down to hell because of the fact they had seen his mighty works. Well, now notice, in the morning he goes to the synagogue, and we're told that he taught them on the Sabbath days, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for the word was with power. Our Lord didn't speak as a scribe or a Pharisee, but one that had authority. Now, we have looked at that before. The thing that he did, there was the spirit of the unclean demon. And I'm going to have occasion in the Gospel of Luke to speak a little bit more in detail about demonism than I have before. We'll see that later on. I've gone into this when we were in the Gospel of Mark, but I intend to go into more detail. The reason is that you and I today are living in the day when demonism has lifted its ugly head again, and Satan worship. Today is a reality, and we have around us today the appearance of demonism. I believe it's a reality, and I believe that there is the working of demons today. Now, our Lord cast the demon out of this individual. And by the way, it'd be pretty difficult to explain the action of some folk today, even under drugs, some of the crimes, some of the awful things they're doing seems unbelievable. 
And the only explanation I think that you can find is that they're under the power and control of Satan. Then we find that the Lord Jesus in the morning went into the synagogue, he taught, and there was the spirit of the unclean demon he cast out. Now in the afternoon he went over, I guess, for the noonday meal at the home of Simon Peter. We've seen that before, and while he was there, why he healed Simon Peter's wife's mother. And my mother-in-law always called my attention to this. She said that the Scripture doesn't call her a mother-in-law, but it's always Simon's wife's mother. And I would always answer her by saying, well, that's a mother-in-law. And so that is exactly what you have here, a mother-in-law. And you could make a lot of stories about mother-in-laws. There are a lot of jokes about them, but the Scripture, for some reason, there's a lot of humor in the Bible, but there's none about mother-in-laws. Our Lord healed Simon Peter's wife's mother. He healed her, and it was a Sabbath day, and they would object to that, of course, but that he did. And you find out also that when he went into the home of Simon, why, he went there for dinner, and this woman had a great fever. The diseases were classified then as little and great fever. She apparently had a disease, something like typhoid. And he stood over her, and using medical terminology again, he used the term be muzzled. That's the way Dr. Luke tells it, you see. And like wild dogs which have broken the leash, and that's what had happened. Our Lord took sin and dealt with it just like that. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. You see, when Christ healed, it was not necessary to lead them off the platform. It didn't come about gradually. It took place immediately. That's the very um, amazing thing. I heard the record of a faith healer not long ago that someone attended the service. They said a cripple was led up there, and the cripple was led off. But somebody came on. They said they had an internal cancer. They were healed immediately of that. May I say to you, it's amazing how the people will accept that type of thing. Why didn't the man who was crippled, why didn't he walk off? without any problem at all, no limp. But if our Lord did it, that's what would happen, my friend. Now, somebody says, well, don't you believe in divine healing? And my question is, what other kind is there? All healing is divine. And that's what Luke's telling us. Doctors do not always recognize that. I had a wonderful doctor who was a member of my church in Texas, and he said to me, he says, I send the bill, but God does the healing. I can merely take out that part that's offending the body, but God will have to do the healing. What a wonderful testimony that is, and it's a great testimony. It's not your faith that would heal you anyway. It's not an individual. It's God, and God uses an instrumentality, and sometimes he does not. His instrumentality today could be a doctor, and now it was evening, late at night, and he went out from one to another, and he touched them. You know, Matthew, in recording this incident, quotes Isaiah. And I'm not going back over that, but you'll notice that our Lord here is healing in a very wonderful way. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He bore the sicknesses and diseases sympathetically. In spite of that, the nation Israel in that day esteemed him stricken. That is the way we esteem him. He did not heal them on the basis of faith as far as we know. His great heart of sympathy is what caused him to move in their behalf. And that's what we're told today, bear ye one another's burdens. Now, you'll notice that he was here and he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. That's verse 44. He's bringing the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand in the presence and person of the king who is there. Now that brings us to the end of chapter 4, and next time we'll pick up with chapter 5 of the gospel of Luke, and I trust you'll be with us. So until next time, may God richly bless you. Yes. 
Continue with us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. In fact, why don't you go ahead and read that after the program. Now, TTB has a great selection of resources that will help you go deeper in the Bible yourself. Or if we can help you find something, you can give us a call as well at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you right back here on the Bible Bus next time. In fact, I'll save you a seat. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?